So welcome to a discussion of milking system efficiency and mastitis as it relates to the milking system. A lot of good information here from 2014, a pro dairy lecture. Um, you can probably find this again online, just like you could the last one. So it's just some real good highlights here from milk quality. Uh, I think it's important to remember. So parlors, typical intervals for maintenance, improved numbers gain. So we're talking about the things we need to do for maintenance and how we increase our throughput, which will be later on in the semester, the other half of this presentation. So Rick Waters, PhD, milk quality from the uh, milk quality, um, quality milk production services, Western Lab, Geneseo. So um, a lot of local stuff here. Um, so if you have any questions, this is the man to talk to. So the goals of our milking system, we want proper milking performance. The cows should milk out completely with little to no teat end damage. We like the attachment to be at the right time. We don't want to um, mess up or uh, impede our oxytocin release. We want it to take the best advantage of it we can. We don't want to transfer mastitis from one animal to another through the equipment. We want to massage the teat. We want a good liner collapse and make sure we relieve the congestion at the teat end. We want things that are easily cleaned and easily serviced or regularly serviced. So the relationship between milking equipment and mastitis, we know that improperly functioning Equipment increase the risk of mastitis. And there are a number of ways that happens. Introducing infected milk to healthy quarters. And we'll talk about the impacts and just cross contamination. We might damage teat ends, which increase the risk of mastitis. We might damage teat tissue. The bruises and stuff, if our liners are collapsing the way they should. Um, can lead to injury and possibly um, bacteria getting in the teat end, introducing bacteria into the teat canal, doing something with our milking equipment that has that. Um, stream cases, the pain leads to a stress response that res uh, suppresses the immune system. So I would think more than likely we're talking about more likely stuff up here, less likely stuff down here. So three ways that milking can, or they can transfer, as we've said already, we take a disease-causing organism and we take it from one cow to the next, either with the teat cups or um, our milking machine in some way, shape, or form uh, transfers that. We affect teat end health. We mentioned those different things already. The teat end, higher teat end scores, that, that callus, that uh, bruising that occurs, the trauma that might occur, or we have some way that we allow bacterial colonization on the teat. Liner slips, um, they are going to allow air in one teacup. They're going to accelerate the milk from one side and push it up the other sides um, and possibly propel bacteria, mastitis causing bacteria, into a teat canal of another. We think about the potential contribution of mastitis. Milking a machine um, usually accounts for about 20% of the mastitis causes, but it's easy to rule out or uh, eliminate. So you can go through and make sure your machine's working right, working right. You clean it, you maintain it. You can eliminate this as a cause of mastitis. Um, cows, you know, breeding over time may help. Uh, milking management, you got to stay on top of things as you uh, harvest the milk from the cows. And then all the things that happen on the farm, uh, you can't eliminate those things, but you can certainly reduce. This is easy to rule out, easy to eliminate as we go forward. So factors of affecting mastitis, we go from the overall things that we might have control over. In areas with a lot of variation. So cows don't like variation. 
and the milking routines are certainly going to introduce a lot of variation. We have a lot of control over these things, and they may be involved in mastitis. As we go down, we have the cow. We don't have as much control over the cow and how she or her udder is shaped, how things work, how she responds, uh, what she's wired to do. At least an individual cow, we can change things over time. So things we have control over, less and less control going down. A uh, lot of variation up here. Again, our milking equipment falls in an area that if we don't keep track of it, we don't stay on top of it, we'll run into trouble. So materials that we've put together here, uh, National Mastitis Council is a great place to go to get some uh, information. A couple other places here that went into so we have your uh, milking system layout. Again, uh, pump, reserve tank, pulsator line, pulsator, milking machine, milk line, uh, receiver jar, sanitary trap, uh, vacuum regulator. All these things need to be put together, uh, set up so we have consistent vacuum. We have things that change very quickly and easily from uh, atmospheric to vacuum. Uh, we don't want any impediments along the way. So vacuum pump, if you've been through all these parts and other lectures, you should understand what they do. So air entering the system through the milking unit, through the pulsator, and through the vacuum regulator. So all those can introduce air into the system. We want them working properly and working smoothly. We want to, when we're evaluating our milking equipment, we want to minimize the vacuum differences throughout the milking system. We don't want to have any bottlenecks. We don't have any leaks in the system. We want to have that consistent vacuum from our vacuum pump all the way to the far end of our loops, either from the milk line or the pulsator line. We want vacuum regu regulation to be optimized and stable. So making sure that we're not going up and down, up and down, up and down. We've got a system that's working smoothly, correctly, and keeping that vacuum at an even level throughout. And we should compare our measured vacuum to National Mastitis Council. What causes vacuum fluctuations? We're looking at uh, constantly leaking air into the system or sporadic leaking air in the system. So anytime we have something that's going to introduce air into the system, we're going to have fluctuation, which is not what we want. So defective, we're not checking things, we're not looking at things, cracks, holes in the lines, bad gaskets, at the pipe fittings, pulsator, and milk line stall cocks. So anything that allows air to get in the way it's not supposed to is going to lead to vacuum fluctuations, especially at the milking unit. We've got a leaky distribution tank, that, that reserve tank. If there are leaks in that system, it's going to cause problems. We've got um, cracks and holes in our uh, hoses and lines. Any of those are going to introduce atmospheric air and it cause our vacuum to fluctuate up and down. Things that are gonna cause problems on an intermittent basis, we have units falling off, we have liner squawks, air bleeding into the system through the uh, teacup, through the milking unit, and then excessive air admission when attaching or detaching the unit. So doing that correct kind of pinch off as we put things on will help reduce that. So. We can control things. Um, these are more in the uh, at the milking at cow side, and these are maintenance and cleaning and checking things and making sure that everything's taken care of, everything's up to date. So we put these things on our regular maintenance check fix. So bending that short milk tube during attachment is going to minimize the air that comes in through the uh, teacup. And that's going to help keep our uh, vacuum um, minimum. So 
some people do that some people don't some systems are designed to do that automatically others you have to kind of manually manipulate that tube to make sure that doesn't happen we want to line our milking units to prevent squawks and fall offs every time they fall off a lot of air bleeds into the system and we've all been in that situation where one falls off they all fall off because we lose the vacuum for the whole system if we use some milking unit supports, we can make sure things are aligned and we don't get the squawks and fall offs. We want to replace the liners um, every thousand cow milkings. So that's a rubber based thing. Our silicone based ones can go a lot longer than that. Make sure our claw and liner vents are open so we have an opportunity for air to come in. We want it to do the way it's supposed to. We don't want to do it. Um, that system is clogged it has to work extra hard you want to make sure that those vents are in there to make that milk move and we don't get clogs in the system if we get slugs of milk in the system we get um a liner fluctuate or vacuum fluctuation uh we also want to check for the completeness of milking uh we don't want to have all these problems up here and that's going to lead to less complete milk. So when we're looking at milking systems, we got to check the T end vacuum. We said it's usually a few points below the overall vacuum in the system. We're looking at something just short of 10 inches of mercury to just short of 13 at the T end. And we have that vacuum level is maintained during the milk flow of the highest producing milk group. So you've got when you've got the most milk in the lines, are you still maintaining that vacuum level? We don't want that to drop if the system is under load. So when we're thinking about vacuum reserve, you need 35 cubic feet per minute plus one cubic feet per minute per milking unit. So at the dairy, we're looking at 50 CFM to be pumped out in any minute. Uh, we want to make sure we have that in the lines ready to go um, in case our uh, system is uh, units fall off or things like that so we'll do a unit fall off test we take a unit and let all the air come in we want to make sure that the uh, we don't lose more than six tenths of an inch of mercury in the total vacuum in the system that indicates we've got a good vacuum Reserve and we've got a good regulator response. If we don't have that, if it drops a whole lot more than that, we got to check our line, see if it's sized correctly, see if it's clean, see if the air can flow through, and then check our regulator, make sure it's clean, make sure it's operating smoothly. If it goes there, we got to check our pulsators. We need to um, make sure that each cycle is working right. Um, that it shifts back and forth um, within a line. So we shift back and forth between the atmospheric and vacuum easily and quickly. So we talk about uh, fractions of a second here to get um, the switch from one to the other. Uh, the A, B, C, D phase, I don't think I've ever presented those to you, but making sure that our, our pulsators um, quickly and cleanly change to the different atmosphere they're supposed to have. So our pulsators need to be clean, they need to be moving smoothly, um, they need to be oiled and lubricated so they don't hitch up. So I'll make sure. Computer data, we can check our um, milk meters, see if any one stall is giving us more problems. Do we have less milk compared from one stall compared to the others, that these can indicate that there are stall specific issues. And we might give that stall a, a closer look. If we're getting low flow through any unit, we need to think about that. Or if we think about machine on time, if any given stall is excessively long, we want to check the pulsator, the pulsator lines, to make sure that we're. Um, efficiently harvesting the milk. So all these things can point toward a unit that's not working optimally. And we go through it from the pulsator, uh, the connection to the pulsator line, all the way down through 
the teacups and check to see if each part is working, each part is hole free, um, each part is clear hoses of uh, moisture and debris. Is there anything left in the system after cleaning? Is there any chunks or anything that we need to remove that are clogging things up or slowing things down? Uh, either vacuum flow into the system or milk flow out of the system. So listen for air leaks. We need to pay attention to that. Um, you can hear that hiss around. Make sure that we follow up on that, take a look at it. Quickly, we're checking the air regulator, the pulsator filters. Uh, we're checking our stall cocks for air leaks, making sure there's good there. If we have uh, electrical pulsators, not pneumatic, we need to check those connections, make sure that we're getting good electrical pulses to the pulsators, make sure that our short air tubes are um, hole free and functioning, make sure that all the connections, uh, visual and audio, so listening to things. Uh, monthly maintenance, graph air pulsators, so doing your uh, air inside your teacup, how much, uh, how quickly do we change from atmospheric to vacuum and back again. Uh, monthly, we might want to break down and clean our air regulator, flush the pulsator lines, making sure there's not enough, no gunk in those so air can move through quickly and cleanly. Check the condition of our milk hoses, pulsator lines. Do they need to be changed? Looking at them, um, doing that on a regular basis. Once a month is recommended here. Checking gaskets for leaks. Clean the inside of the trap. Um, inspect all the floats, making sure everything's clean. And what it's for six months, having the entire milking system evaluated. Your dealer coming out, testing everything, making sure everything. Where it's supposed to be uh, replacing all the rubber parts again talk to your dealer talk to your manufacturer how it's as uh, um, all that stuff needs to be done so replacing your rubber parts rebuild your pulsators take them down take them apart make sure everything is lubricated clean and what's supposed to be there six months is a suggestion work with your dealer work with your service company um, Figure out what the schedule should be. As we said before, care of our milky says we're talking about maintenance and cleaning. Uh, we want to establish whatever procedure it is for our system. We may establish and make sure that schedule gets followed. We check and change as we need to, and then have scheduled regular system diagnostics um, coming in, making sure everything's working the way it's supposed to. We got to clean it. So again, you've got your daily, your weekly, your monthly things that you need to do. Uh, make sure all of it gets cleaned. Make sure you follow instructions on the cleaners, on the uh, systems. Make sure your SOPs are correct and in place. And always or regularly check your water temperatures to make sure that they're hot enough to get the job done. As we said, milking equipment and mastitis, we've got increased risk or mastitis when we have pulsator failure. If the liners open all the time, you're gonna uh, damage that teed end, you're gonna congest that teed end and predispose it to bacteria load, which will increase the likelihood of infection. Over milking, so we have teed end damage when there's no milk flow. You've got a constant um, kind of pull on that teed end. When you've got the milk, the milk dissipates that vacuum at the teat end. Liner squawks, those lead to impacts going across the way. And if we have vacuum fluctuations, we can introduce bacteria into the teat canal. We can move things around. We can damage the teat end. So checking our vacuum reserve, making sure we have enough vacuum at a constant level. So. As a rule, the economics of maintenance, we're looking at five cents a hundred or about 3% of parlor operating costs, um, costing about buck 47 per hundred weight to operate. So 
our clean and repair um, costs are pretty low. Um, so that could, too much money is not an excuse for not an excuse for doing it. So we want to evaluate that parlor on a annual basis. What do we need to change? What do we need to replace? What more things do we need to add? Take home points. We need to establish those SOPs and also um, do that stuff that we need to do on a regular basis. It's fairly cheap. Um, we've got good equipment maintenance. We can achieve parlor efficiency, good, clean, efficient milk out should lead to um, getting things done, getting our turns per hour, getting our parlor efficiency where it needs to be.